Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1978 film Piranha. Yes, the original Piranha, but it feels kind of weird saying that because Piranha is not so original because it's totally based on Jaws from 1975. Now, another thing I want to say real quick, put, put down in the comments, do you think I should review the Jaws films? Because at the moment, well, I watched Piranha on HBO at the moment because it's there. So if you have HBO, you have the HBO Now or HBO Go app. Go ahead and check Piranha out on there. But at the, also at the moment, they have all four Jaws films. So put a comment down there. Should I review all four Jaws films? Because I will do that if you want to. Uh, but anyway, like I said, Piranha was based off of Jaws. It was totally a Jaws ripoff. And I actually like the fact that they kind of make a nod to that in the film. Basically making fun of it. Making a joke and just being like, haha, yes, we ripped off Jaws. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we go on. So this is directed by Joe Dante. If people don't know, Joe Dante has done a ton of stuff, but some of the most memorable things he's done, Gremlins, Gremlins 2, The Howling, and The Burbs. Uh, all movies I quite enjoy, especially of all those, I'd probably say The Burbs is my favorite because it's very funny and it's very horror-driven too at the same time, but tons of awesome comedy in that one. This was written by Richard Robinson, who did films such as Kingdom of the Spiders and High Ballin', which I've not seen High Ballin' or Kingdom of the Spiders, but High Ballin' sounds like it's not even horror, but Kingdom of the Spiders, obviously, yes. Also written by um, John Sayles, who wrote the scripts for Alligator and The Howling. Obviously, The Howling, he was then, again, working with uh, Joe Dante, so very cool. This is a Roger Corman-produced film, and... If people aren't very familiar with Roger Corman, he bankrolled a lot of very low-budget, crazy type of horror films like Piranha, like Death Race 2000, which is one of my favorite Corman productions, like Chopping Mall, you know, fun cult classic type films like that. And for that reason, I love Corman. I think his body of work is great and inspirational and just a gift to the horror community, if you will. Kevin McCarthy in this film, by far, is my favorite actor, even though, unfortunately, we don't get a ton of him in the film because he goes out relatively early in a very stupid way, which I'll talk about later, um, which, you know, it doesn't make sense for his character, but like I said, I'll talk about it later. So, uh, Kevin McCarthy played Dr. Hoke. Uh, you know, he's the guy with all the knowledge. He was working with these creatures for the government. He was in some films such as The Howling as well and the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which I've seen and is very good. You should check that out. The budget for this film was $770,000 and it ended up making $16 million. This thing was a cash cow for Roger Corman. Kudos. Good, good for you. Awesome. The, congratulations. I, I, I love the fact that that's the case. Uh, obviously this was based off Jaws, uh, Universal, it was so based off Jaws that Universal actually considered placing an injunction against, against the Piranha coming out because it was coming out at the same time as they were releasing Jaws 2. So they really didn't want the competition. That was stopped from happening though, the injunction that is, because Steven Spielberg actually stepped in and gave Piranha a very positive review and encouraged Universal to not file that injunction against Piranha. So thank you, Steven Spielberg, for not crushing a film, basically. Um, that's a lot of stuff I've kind of heard about Spielberg is that he's a a nice guy, a good guy, a fair guy, if you will. And I think that definitely shows that. So this film actually had a sequel in 1982, which I have not seen, but I really do want to see. And obviously, they le at the end of this film, which I'll talk more about, they leave it very open to going to a sequel, which, you know, a lot of films do have done that and still do that. Because, hey, who doesn't want to make more money? So it was Piranha 2, The Spawning, which was the sequel in 1982. It was then remade in 1995 for TV. It was a for TV made-for-TV movie. And then in 2010, there was a more modern remake. And then there was a sequel in 2012 to the remake in 2010. Now, uh, directing-wise, the, um, the 2010 one was done by Alexander Aja, who had done things like High Tension and the Hills Have Eyes remake. And the 2012 follow-up to that one was done by John Gulliger, who is probably best known for being on Project Greenlight, which he won, and then he made the Feast movies, all three of those, which I could review those at some point. Uh, Roger Ebert, when this came out, uh, known... 
enemy to horror films, Roger Ebert. Um, I have a lot of respect for the guy, but he just inappropriately hated horror films, in my opinion. Uh, he mocked the practical effects of this and also called out the fact that characters, upon hearing that there were piranhas in the water, would then jump in the water so it didn't really make sense. He kind of had a little bit of a point with the characters kind of doing dumb things, but the practical effects, like, come on, like, what were you going to do back then, especially on a low budget? What were you going to do? I, I honestly think for the time that the practical effects were good. You know, yes, it looks a little bit corny when they're showing the, the shots of, like, the school of Piranha kind of coming through the water. That looks weird. It looks corny because they're not really moving all that much. It's just, like, very stationary things just being moved through. But the attack scenes, I think, look appropriate, appropriately frantic. Um, you can't really see what's going on. There's a lot of thrashing. But you see little bits and pieces of, like, the people's arms, the blood flying, some bites that they put on the bodies, and obviously, like, little pieces of the actual fish. And I feel like that's a good representation of the attack because when piranha swarm, is that the right, when they attack, um, it, it is frantic and, it, and it's very um, confused as what's going on and especially underwater. So I think they did an excellent job cinematically capturing the attack scenes. So Ebert's off on that, in my opinion. You, okay, so now going into the actual like film itself. You just know something is going to go wrong when you see the no trespassing sign in the beginning and people hiking up to that sign and going past it. And that's when we have these teenagers, these horny teenagers who want a skinny dip and <laughs> in a what could be sewage treatment plant as the one guy lays out. He's like, we don't even know. But the funny thing is, too, in the beginning, what does he say? He says... Exact quote, besides, a little law-breaking will do you good. And I was like, will it? The, a, that's a really weird quote, uh, especially because he doesn't expand on that. He's just like, a little law-breaking will do you good. It doesn't do him good, and it doesn't do her good. But it's funny because he initially is like, let's break the law, let's do these risky things. And then they get to the water, and she's the risk-taker at that point. And she flips it on him and is just like, hey, let's skinny dip in this. And then he's all of a sudden afraid and is like... Is this poop and pee water, basically? This could be a sewage treatment plant. We don't know. But then he just gets in because boobs. And then you also, right there, within the first few minutes, have your blood, your breasts, and your beast being shown because you see the eyeball open up, the, the eyelid open up and show the eyeball of one of the piranhas as the woman kind of splashes in the water with her hand. So how fast they get to the boob the, sorry, the blood, breasts, and beast is crazy in this film, but it sets it up to be a crazy fun film, in my opinion. Uh, and I really, by the way, love that moment of showing, like, it's just dark, and then you just see the piranha eye open. I think that's such a cool moment, especially because it's done at night. You know, everything's scarier at night. The music, when they find the water, has underwater sounds to it, like, kind of like bubble-ish which I thought was really cool, like incorporating the actual music to make it sound underwater. That's a cool thing. The other thing is there's this kind of um, this particular noise that they always use to signal that the piranhas are in close proximity and when they're actually attacking. And it's kind of like this this rolling, warbling underwater type sound, like, blah, 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 you know, um, if you've watched it, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about, which if you haven't watched it, you should, probably shouldn't be watching this because it's like all spoilers. But So stop, go watch it, come back. The Jaws video game. Now this is the moment. They jump to this woman playing a Jaws video game. And that is the funny nod, in my opinion, to yes, this is ripping off Jaws, basically. I, I love that moment. I think it's super funny. It, it is like this kind of nod to the audience of, you see what we're doing here? You see what we're doing? We're fine with it. We're proud of it, actually. It's funny. Uh, the old man talking about his life re revolving around the river indicates how catastrophic the piranhas being released eventually is. You know, that's when the guy, when we're first introduced to Grogan, um, the old guy who ends up getting eaten up uh, is kind of talking about like, you know, I live by this river. You know, I do everything with this river, basically. And he just goes over all the ways in which the, Im the river impacts his life. That's a really good moment of showing how important the river is to that community and the people who kind of live along it meaning that it gives more uh, importance to it being infected, well, infected, being 
uh, overrun with piranha, basically. It, it, it makes it even worse for those types of people. Uh, when, the, when he kind of, like, points out the dog, though, I, d I did kind of initially get this feeling of, like, I think the dog's going to get it. Like, I feel like that was indicating it. It makes you a little nervous. But luckily, the dog ended up being fine. But the old man, not so much. Uh, they do a good job of establishing Gro Grogan as a curmudgeonly hermit booze hound. This is the perfect reluctant hero for a Corman film I wrote down, which is totally accurate. This guy is pissy with life. He just wants to drink and be left alone. He's a mountain man hermit, and when the person trying to track down these teenagers shows up, he literally tells her to go away <laughs> and is just a mean dude. But you know what? He's the hero. And I love it when you have kind of like crazy heroes like that. And especially in a Corman film. The secret lab scene is amazing in this. All the creatures being developed and the one that you end up seeing creeping around, which is not a piranha, but what is that? You see a bunch of creatures in there, like, preserved and actually alive, where you're just like, what is this? Like, what's the government doing with these things? Uh, it further kind of deepens the mystery of what's going on at that lab and why. That's the other thing. Which the great thing is we actually get a why in this, which is cool. At least for the piranhas, we get a why. For the, all the other creatures, you just assume, well, there's other things going on with the government along the same lines as what they're doing with the piranhas. The, their tie-in of the creation of these like mutant piranhas, basically, to the Vietnam War is actually a good story point. It's really good backstory, in my opinion, and it kind of deepens that uh, can't-trust-the-government type situation that was going on with a lot of horror films back then. And this kind of impact of the government doing all these things in secrecy and not telling the the uh, um, the people of the United States about it will eventually come back to literally bite them. In this instance, to literally bite them in the water and kill them. So I, I just like how they set that up. Plus, the lab, that secret lab just looked good. Like, it looked cool. I love that scene. Um, it was a good touch finding a dog skeleton at the bottom of the hatchery that after they had... The hatchery pond after they drained it i thought that was a really cool kind of extra like oh they've been feeding something's going on here which then it begs the question like did the dog just happen to wander in and fall in there or were they keeping these alive by feeding it dogs and other things i don't know we need to find that out you know maybe uh dr hoke could have uh could have spoken to that but he ended up exiting real quick I love the foreshadowing of that, you know, main counselor guy saying to Grogan's kid, people eat fish, fish don't eat people. Oh, is that how it is? Because that's how you feel as an audience member. Like, when he says that, you're just like, oh, you are so wrong, sir, and you're about to find out how wrong you are. Especially when the fish eventually jumps out of the water and bites him in the face, which is a really hilarious moment that I just love in the film. I feel like the way they shot the attack scenes was good. Yeah, like I said, it was frantic and hard to fully tell what was going on, which which feels realistic for these mutant piranhas. It feels very brutal. That's another thing, very violent, very brutal, and that's what you want in this film, basically. The old guy's body with the stripped legs looks really, really gnarly. I thought they did a really good job with the practical effects there. Uh, the actual attack was a little bit, you know, quick, and I feel like they could have drawn it out a little bit more but when you see his body actually on land and you're just seeing like the stripped legs it's like it's pretty nasty and they did a good job there's so much blood bubbling up when the guy um in the boat gets his arm in there and it get it gets a, he gets attacked the guy who's in the boat with his son and then the son gets on top of it on top of the boat and he's fine just like all the bubbling that was going on and how much blood was going you're like whoa that's a crazy amount of blood uh, it doesn't make sense. This is the moment where Hoke jumps in and he's, like, going to try and save the kid. And it really doesn't make sense that, that Hoke would jump in the water to go save the kid because, one, they were almost close enough to get to the kid. Like, they could have, on the raft, gotten close enough to get him safely there. And the other thing is Hoke is the guy who knows what these mutant piranhas are. And he's also been warning people the whole time. Like, don't go in the water. Don't stick your hand in there. Um, so he knows the dangers. He would not. Like, it doesn't make sense for his character to actually jump in and go after that kid so that's a big moment that where ebert was kind of right where it doesn't make sense that these characters kind of just jump in the water him being the main one uh and then hoax hoax dies and with him all the knowledge of these piranha and how to defeat them the situation at that 
point becomes so much more dire in the minds of the audience because they know there's the guy with all the information. He would know how to kill them, and he's gone. Um, by the way, sorry if you hear someone mowing their yard in the background. I hope it's not showing up in this. Uh, it seems like the piranha are intelligent when they're biting through the ropes that hold the raft together. That's an interesting thing, so it makes me kind of think they don't really talk about this, I don't think, unless I missed it. But the, are the piranha intelligent, kind of? Because it seems like they're intentionally trying to pick apart this raft in order to get to the people there. So it's this extra, you know, extra aspect of you're dealing with intelligent beings potentially as well. Although they don't really go down that road too far. Uh, the government shows up and acts like they know everything and they can take care of it. But Grogan actually lives there and is the, actually the best resource of knowledge. And he actually shows that. First of all, he's a jerk to the government people, rightfully so in this instance, because the government created the problem. Grogan is going to solve the problem. But how he points out, like, your logic and what you're saying here doesn't make sense. So let me show you the path that they can take to get to where it becomes a problem. Uh, and then obviously they need Grogan. That's set up very early. It's never a surprise when Dick Miller pops up in movies like this. I loved him as Buck Gardner in this film. He's great. He plays perfectly the guy, the politician, who's like, we're just going to deny that this is a thing so that we don't make people panic. And then once he's faced with the the reality that people are being eaten, in a funny way, actually, it's delivered, where he's like, I don't want to hear, I told you not to talk about that. Now what about it? And he's like, the piranha are eating the guests. And then he's just like, <sighs> then he has to deal with it. You can't deny it any longer. And he just, Dick Miller, as usual, does a great job with that. They really work up the peril of the kids getting in the water in this film. It just gets, it, it keeps creeping closer and closer. As you know, during the film, the piranha are moving further downstream. So they keep cutting back and forth between Grogan and everyone trying to stop the piranha and then the kids and what peril they're going to be in. Now, you kind of get the sense that they're not going to go fully go there, though, and have the kids get attacked, but oh, they do, and to great effect, and I'm surprised they went there back then, but I'm glad they did because it adds to the horror of the film, really, it, and it's more realistic because what are you going to do in that instance? Have the piranha just go for the counselors and not go for the kids? No, they would go for whatever they find first, whatever fresh meat is available first even though actual piranha don't eat people. But, you know, that's the thing. Um, you kind of feel like they won't... Oh, yeah, I already talked about that, sorry. And the one jumping out of the water, like I talked about before, biting that guy's face, awesome surprise moment in the film. Uh, I love the shots of people having a good time in the water because as an audience member, you're thinking, oh, these people have no idea what's coming. That's one of those awesome things where the audience experience of having the full picture, like really knowing what's going on and then observing people who don't know anything and you're like, oh, you like you see and you're projecting ahead in your mind what is coming, what is going to happen. And there's a lot of that that goes on with this film when you're watching it. They just keep throwing potential victims at you in this film. That's another thing I love because it really creates this situation of wondering like, Who's going to get it? You know, of all these potential victims they've thrown out, who's going to get killed? Who's going to get eaten up and live? Or are all of them going to get it? And it just creates possibilities. And you're just like, oh man, like, it's this buffet for the piranha. And what are they going to choose? And in what way are they going to do away with them? You wonder how much action can be worked into a piranha movie in the first place. And then there's actually an, an explosion. Uh, the fact that they have an explosion in this is just like, yeah, we're going to take it to the next level. We're already giving you a ton of actual piranha action. Why don't we just throw in a, a Michael Bay type explosion before Michael Bay? But <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Watching it now, you think that. Uh, as soon as people start swimming to the floating bar, which, by the way, a floating bar is awesome. And that floating bar looked like a lot of fun. I would like to participate in that. Um, but when people start actually swimming to that floating bar, you know it's going to sink. You know it's potentially going to go down because they intentionally let you see a sign that had the maximum occupancy, which I believe was only 18 people. Um, so it kind of like ups the ante. You know, as these people are going there, you're aware, you're thinking, oh my God, it said 18 people maximum and all these people are climbing on and here it goes. And then everyone's in peril. Breaking glass underwater sure looks cool, I wrote down. Uh, the part where Grogan gets tied up and he's going to go underwater to try and, like, 
let the pollution go. He um, he breaks through the glass of the window, and it just looks like it's an awesome visual. It looks really cool. It's like the glass just like floats away. Um, I just like that. Uh, the piranha really messed up Grogan, by the way. I didn't know when I initially watched this, which when I just watched it was like the second time I've seen it, I think. Um, initially when I watched it, I kind of felt like Grogan was going to end up getting away unscathed, but I actually really liked the aspect of him getting pretty messed up by these piranha and being in kind of bad shape at the end, um, because it feels more realistic. Like those things are relentless. They were getting pretty much everyone. So why wouldn't they get Grogan? And they did. And I like that aspect of it. But when he's getting attacked, it kind of feels like he's not going to survive that. And you kind of get that scare when uh, the woman, I forget her name in this, is pulling him up and the rope is severed at the end. And you're just like, oh no, he's done. But then his hand comes up and he's alive. And they're like, oh, Grogan. And I wrote down, and pollution saves humanity. Well, maybe in this situation. The idea to pollute them and just kill them is funny because it runs opposite of kind of what we know as a society where we have to, you know, take care of the environment and not pollute things because then that's going to take us with it eventually because you're destroying the environment, which we need to live. But it's just this kind of funny thing in the film where it's like pollution will save us. And it kind of does at the, at the time being, well, for the time being at the end of this film, but they don't fully resolve things. They don't, um, tell you or they don't fully um, indicate to you that they're all dead like it's just this kind of we think we solved it for now and that's kind of how they leave it and I really like that so it, it's this real unknown and obviously it sets it up for doing another film which I really really love um, uh, it, and this fits in with a lot of films at the t at the time that likes that like to focus on government secrecy and how they basically lead to these dangerous catastrophes. I already kind of talked about that a little bit, but this was very common with a lot of films back in the 70s, back in the 80s. It's still being incorporated from time to time into horror films, and it works, you know? Like, people, a lot of the times, like, you don't really know everything that the government's doing at, at any time. You know, that's why there are things like FBI, CIA... And what was going on with the piranhas in this feels a lot like, you know, a FBI or CIA, CIA operation. You know, it's it's that whole thing of what is the government doing at any time? And and could they be doing something super dangerous and, and something that's really a bad idea that can end up backfiring on the people who live here? You know, that's what Piranha is at its core. Uh, and this film is fun. Uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. But... I like it a lot. I think it's really fun. I think it's actually a good film. Now, it's interesting because when you look at it, and when I was talking about, you know, Piranha, and then it had the sequel, and then it had the made-for-TV version, and then it had the remake, and then the sequel of that remake, uh, it's crazy to think that those all spawned off of Jaws. So, And Jaws spawned a bunch of other stuff, too. Like, you know, I know uh, humanoid creatures from the, or humanoids from the deep, or uh, I have a review for that on the channel, and there were there were a bunch of other films that kind of were spawned from from Jaws, um, including its sequels. But it's just crazy to think about how impactful that film was on horror, especially underwater horror. And I feel like when people make underwater horror, even nowadays, a lot of it feels like it's still inspired by Jaws. So, anyway. Thanks, everyone, for checking this out. Let me give you my rating on this film. Uh, so out of five stars with half stars in play, it's not a perfect film, obviously. there are It's hokey. It's low budget. It, but it's it's a good time. But you know what? All things considered, I'm going to give it a four-star rating. I think it's a four out of five stars. I really do. And uh, I quite enjoy Piranha. Joe Dante did a great job with the directing. The acting, for the most part, for what it is, is pretty good. And uh, the writing, the writing is fun. Like I said, super smart having that kind of like Vietnam tie-in to the, to the whole thing with the piranhas. They could have easily just done this film and just been like, the piranhas just exist because it's the government doing bad things in secrecy. But they, they gave it backstory, which makes it so much better and so much richer. So I love that. But anyway, four out of five stars for Piranha. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, put some comments down here. Let's talk about it. Do you have differing opinions? or you just want to talk about Piranha, let's do that. Do me a quick favor, though. If you like anything I do, this review or any other reviews, hit that subscribe button. That's your way to repay me. Not making money doing this. I'm just spending my time doing this for for people to reach out and say, hey, let's connect as, as 
lovers of horror, and we can talk about it. So if you've already subscribed, give me that thumbs up just to keep me going and let me know, hey, I'm still watching. Good job. Uh, but thanks again for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.